The Seahawks had a weird free agency, to say the least. Hey 12s, welcome in. Today I'm recapping all of the moves that the Seahawks have made in this free agency cycle. They were pretty slow, mostly focusing on some of those re-signings that they wanted to get done. But I think they made a lot of really smart moves and mostly filled their roster holes. But we'll get back to that. Let's begin by looking at one of the cheaper signings this offseason, one that I'm actually a little bit excited about. The Seahawks signed Jonathan Hankins, a veteran nose tackle, to a one-year, $2 million contract. To me, this is a shift towards playing a heavier nose tackle like Mike McDonald had last year in Michael Pierce. I know that Hankins is only listed at somewhere between like I've seen 320 to upwards of like 330. But honestly, I think he weighs closer to 340 or 350. I mean, here he is next to Mozzie Smith, who is listed at 337. I think he got down to closer to 300, but still, like this guy is easily 40 pounds heavier than Mozzie Smith. The Seahawks had one of the latest nose tackles in the game last year in Jaron Reed, which worked fine, but I think Hankins might bring the beef that Mike McDonald wants in his defense. Jaron Reed will certainly get the, all of the snaps that he needs because he really did play well last year, but I'm curious if he's going to get pushed out to be more of a heavy three tech instead of a light nose tackle. Regardless, Hankins has shown strength against double teams and an adequate pass rush to be a solid contributor to this defense. The Hawks really only had two NFL caliber nose tackles last year, and that forced them to turn to getting snaps from practice squad level players. I feel much better knowing now that they have three guys that I would be comfortable with getting snaps. You're going to find that my grades might be a bit lower than most, but for me, on my scale, a C is an average signing. Teams are built on these signings, so by no means do I dislike a signing if I give it a C. For Hankins, I'm going to give this signing a B-. Obviously, it's a one-year deal for an aging player, so there really isn't much upside. But getting a third nose tackle is really important to try to fix this run defense, and I think he'll be a good scheme fit and have a great year. Next up, let's talk about Rayshon Jenkins. Jenkins got cut by the Jags this offseason, and the Seahawks signed him to a two-year, $12 million contract. Jenkins, to me, is a true, strong safety, and in my opinion, he will be a pretty clean replacement for Jamal Adams. Jenkins is not the strongest overall coverage player, although he does have this excellent PBU versus Kelsey. Overall, he's most valuable in what he brings with his flexibility and his run defense. Jenkins lined up all over the place, in linebacker role, more as a corner, or as a deep free safety. This flexibility is exactly what Mike McDonald is looking for, and I think this is one of the best traits that he brings because he can play all of these roles at a solid level. Jenkins also brings the physicality that Jamal Adams was famous for without the crazy missed tackle rate. He is a solid tackler, but he really brings the boom when he's flying downhill. Just look at this hit on Isaiah Pacheco, one of the most physical backs in the NFL. He is unafraid to insert himself into the run fit and does a great job of being a physical, active player. I don't think he brings that much as a blitzer, but this is someone you, you can always rely on to find his way onto the field in some capacity. So he's really shown to be a durable and dependable player, which Jamal Adams was not to say the least. To me, this is just a strict upgrade over Adams, and that's great because Jenkins costs just a fraction of Adams' monster contract. The downsides of this signing is that Jenkins is 30 years old, which means that a long-term extension and thus high upside is probably pretty unlikely. He'll be a solid starter for the Seahawks, but the contract doesn't have that much guaranteed money, so I think the value is about right. Remember that I said my grades would be lower than you're used to, but I would give this probably like a D+. It's a decent value and a good scheme fit with a pretty big need, and I'm excited to see what he's able to do. But honestly, there's another safety that we signed that I think is cheaper and in my opinion even better, but we'll get to him later. If you want to skip this section, feel free. There are timestamps down below so you can jump to my thoughts on Jerome Baker. But I did want to take this chance to announce that I've launched a Patreon. If you appreciate the content that I provide here and want to support me, there is a link in the corner or down in the description so you can check it out. As of now, benefits include access to submitting Q&A questions that I'll answer in regular videos, as well as access to an exclusive unscripted film breakdown. It's on Geno Smith on a game that you might not expect. 
I would definitely be looking to expand the benefits as we approach the regular season, but I really appreciate your support. And with that, let's get back to the video. Jerome Baker probably has the biggest name out of all the outside free agents the Hawks signed. If you watch my Tyro Dodson film breakdown, you'll know that he is an undersized playmaking linebacker. Well, Baker is even more undersized than Dodson. And, I mean, honestly, at 225 pounds, Baker is really small. This lack of size is offset by his speed and his skill to stop the run. He is excellent at shooting gaps and making plays while working around the offensive lineman. He is instinctive and smart, which allows him to still make the splash plays that you need from your linebackers. His size will often hurt him, and he makes him a little bit less consistent of a run defender than you would like. As if the offensive line gets to him, he can often get thrown out of the play. But this doesn't happen too often. He needs to work a lot harder than some linebackers because he needs to really make sure that he stays clean to make the play, but he does a really good job of making up for his lack of size in the run game. To me, at least for what I've seen on film, Baker offers very little as a pass rusher. I know some people have hyped this up as a strength of his game, but I just didn't see that on tape. I mean, here he gets stonewalled by a running back. He just doesn't have the strength or the violence to be an elite blitzing linebacker. Again, if you get him free, like if he gets a free shot, yes, he's fast, he can run and chase, um, but he lacks the ability to really win one-on-one. -on -one. In coverage, Baker offers so much more than anything we've had at linebacker for a really long time. He's really fast and has the speed to keep up with running backs and tight ends easily. I like his zone instincts as well, and in a Vic Vangio defense, he was asked to play a lot of zone. The tape honestly isn't as good as Dodson's. Um, I think Dodson is a better run defender and a better blitzer, um, but Baker offers a lot in coverage, particularly his snaps in man coverage I was really excited to see. I hate to give this less than a glowing grade because I really do like the player, but there are some pretty clear downsides to this signing. I think the biggest one is his age. He's going to turn 28 in this upcoming season. Fun fact, his birthday is on Christmas. But this does raise a long-term problem. Baker is a player who wins primarily because he's an elite mover at the position. That's not really a profile I want to rely on as he enters his 30s. So I don't know if he's, you know, the, if he's young enough to be re-signed as like a cornerstone to this defense. One year for $7 million is probably a pretty fair value, maybe a slight overpay. And I do like the fit, but I'm going to give this a C- because if I had to guess, this would only be a one-year thing. But again, I'm really excited about the player, and I think he's going to bring a lot to this defense. Noah Fant, to me, was a surprise re-signing, but I think this was a welcome one. Fant is a young and exciting former first-round pick. His greatest attribute is his speed, and as you can see on these plays, he really pulls away from the defenders. He has excellent speed for a tight end and is really good at weaponizing it. In Ryan Grubb's offense, I expect he will be the primary tight end. For the past couple of years while he's been here in Seattle, he has been in a rotation with Disley and Parkinson, both of whom left this offseason. But now, at least at this moment, he looks like he will be the lead tight end and will take a far more prominent role. Before diving into his film, I was a little bit concerned about his blocking, but that is actually an underrated part of his game. He brings power and technique that I was not expecting, but it makes him a solid, dependable blocker. Fant is a well-rounded number one tight end that I'm excited to see what he's able to do in a different offense with more snaps. I'm not going to lie and say this contract isn't somewhat of a projection, though, at two years, $22 million. Fant had just over 800 yards in the past two years combined, and if he's going to make that contract worth it, he needs to double that over this contract. I think that he is going to do just that, but he definitely needs to prove that he is worth this. I'm going to give this signing a B-. minus. I think this will work out well and he'll be a great contributor, but we will see. Every single one of these film breakdowns, there's someone who really surprises me, and in this one, I think the biggest surprise is Kayvon Wallace. Wallace played for both the Cardinals and the Titans last year, as he got cut once Buda Baker came off of injury. But I think that he's actually a pretty solid safety. In Arizona, he mostly lined up as a single high player and had good instincts and range. I think he holds up really well in this position, and he's definitely someone I would trust to play this role in Seattle. Then when he got to Tennessee, he was in a completely different system. He played a lot more strong safety or in more split safety looks. He was pretty decent in these and often showed off his range again. I don't know if he's the best at clicking and closing from zone coverages, and that would be the one weakness if I had to give one, but I think McDonald can work around that. 
Wallace also played some linebacker role on some plays and showed his physicality. At one year, one and a half million dollars, I think that this is a tremendous value. He will get snaps, and honestly, I think he's going to bring about as much as Jenkins will. This is the guy who I was mentioning in Jenkins' section. I could be wrong, and maybe this guy get cut in camp. But based on the tape I watched, I think he's a decent starter-level player that we're going to have in a rotation at safety, which is super exciting. It's just one year, but Wallace is still young enough for the upside to be somewhere in there. So I give the signing a grade of a B. I know that this wasn't technically a signing because the Hawks actually traded for him, but I'm going to throw this in here. I love the Sam Howell trade. I think if he's even just a backup, he's going to give you what you got from Drew Locke at a fraction of the cost. Depending on what trade chart you use, I've seen it come out anywhere from netting the commanders a late third to an early seventh round pick, so do with that what you will. I don't think we gave up that much for him. The Hawks didn't really lose any picks in the trade, they just moved back about 34 spots. Go watch my film breakdown if you haven't already. I've watched even more of this film, and the more I watch him, I think he will get a chance to start in 2025. If Gino doesn't have the year that I hope he will have, I think the Hawks might move on from him and let Howell get a shot at it. But we will see. At the bare minimum, he is a good backup with starter upside, and to me that makes this a really great trade. I will give this a grade of an A. I'm just going to refer you to my full breakdown of Dodson, which is linked in the corner. But if you just want the Cliff Nose version, this guy is awesome. Um, he's undersized for sure, but he's a terrific playmaker in all parts of the game. I do want to clarify that I do think he's a great coverage player. I don't know if that came across super clear when I was arguing that he's not elite. But by no means is he one of the best coverage linebackers. Yeah, but he's really good and he's an excellent player. At one year, $4.3 million, this is an absolute steal. I think Dodson is probably going to be like a top 10 linebacker when all is said and done. Because he's so good at everything, and to get that for under $5 million is amazing. I wish that this deal was longer, but I think that Dodson really wanted to get back to free agency as fast as possible. So if he plays well in 2024, he can cash in. This is a player that I already kind of am looking to extend next offseason, if he plays well, and I think he will, so he could get a three or four year extension in 2025. I think Dodson could be a centerpiece of the Seahawks' future plans, but he is only a, on a one year deal. Overall, I'm going to also give this an A. This is a great value with future upside, but again, it's just one year. George Fant is probably one of my favorite signings, not really because of the player, although I think he's a good player and welcome back, we missed you, but more because of what this signifies for John Schneider. To me, the Abe Lucas injury probably cost the Seahawks a chance at the playoffs. Jake Kerhand and a 40-year-old Jason Peters getting as many snaps as they did really cost the Seahawks a game or two pretty easily. I applaud them for their effort, of course, but this simply cannot be your backup tackle plan. George Fant brings the Seahawks some depth at tackle that they haven't had in a long while. Fant was the Texans' full-time right tackle last year, and on tape he was pretty decent. He has good punch timing, which allows him to hold up against TJ Watt in these clips. By no means was he an elite pass protector, but he was pretty solid. In the run game, Fant was slightly worse. I guess you could say he was alright. He is by no means a mauler, and he whiffs a lot more than you would like. There are some solid snaps, but he's certainly not a plus run blocker. Overall, Fant looks pretty good to me. As of now, it sounds like he'll just be a backup, and if maybe if the Seahawks are like moving Lucas inside, that'll change. Um, that is something I've heard thrown out that they might kick Lucas inside. But for now, he is just a backup, and this is a pretty ideal backup. His contract was initially reported as a two-year, $14 million deal, which would be a lot of money to pay a backup. But it turns out that was more like a two-year, $9 million deal with very little guarantees. I give this signing an A-. It shows that the Seahawks are committed to not having to like pry a guy out of retirement again just to get replacement level play. They really want to have an answer at tackle. And I love the fit, and I think his experience can also help these young tackles develop. So overall, this is a pretty good signing. I expected that I would hate this contract, and I'm not going to lie and say that I didn't have a fair amount of sticker shock when I heard that he got $21 million per year. But after diving into the tape, I think this guy is going to be worth it. Big Cat was really one of the few players that popped on film consistently. His get off, his intelligence, and his pass rushing skills make him a really good defensive tackle. As a run defender, he does everything you could ask from him. 
He holds up against double teams, he is a playmaker, and he's always in the right spot. I think that he brings so much as an impact three technique that he's really going to be able to help out the run defense from that alignment with his consistency and his splash plays. As a pass rusher, he has a wicked bull rush and amazing get off. This is often how defensive tackles win and William shows tremendous power very often. I actually think that we haven't seen the best of Williams because he played so many snaps. In Williams' first start with the Hawks, he was really just settling in, but since his second week through the end of the year, he got an average of 78% of the defensive snaps. Justin Matabuke, Mike McDonald's star three technique from Baltimore, only got 78% of the snaps on just one game and was mostly in the 50 to 60 range with an average of 65 across the entire season. That is a huge difference, and in 2024, we cannot ask Williams to play this much because it really limits his upside. I think with Nwosu coming back, we'll have a pretty good rotation of Williams, Draymond kicking back inside, Jaron Reed kicking out to three technique, and Mike Morris, who I'm quietly excited to see. So this should get Williams a lot more rest and allow him to be even more efficient in 2024. This is a lot of money, but I think Leonard Williams and Mike McDonald will make it worth it, and I can't deny the need. Of course, trading a second round pick for him was a mistake. I think that's pretty obvious. But this contract is actually going to be lived up to, and I think the value is going to look pretty good in a couple of years. I'm going to give this a B-. minus. It is a risk, but he is a great player at a huge need, and the value is pretty average. So, good signing overall. Alright, speed round before we get to some of my final thoughts and a final reflection on this class. Let's look at Pharaoh Brown. He is really just a blocking tight end. You do not want him running any other route other than like a chip and a check down. But as a run blocker, he's strong and he has the energy that you want. As a replacement to Disley, I think one year, $3.2 million is a fine deal and he's going to be a solid contributor. So I give this signing a C+. Last and probably least, we have Nick Harris. Nick Harris is a flexible interior offensive lineman from Cleveland. He's just 25 years old. He has experience at center, guard, and even fullback, and he's here on a cheap deal. But that's really where the positives tend to end. He really doesn't have any highlight blocks. Admittedly, he is a good mover, and when he got his starts late in the season, he was asked to pull a fair amount of times, but he really doesn't have a huge impact on these plays. In pass protection, he's adequate, but he does have a glaring weakness that he's not particularly violent. All over his tape, he more turns guys in the run game instead of actually attacking them. Overall, I hope that this is just a depth backup piece. At one year, $2.5 million, I think this is a little bit rich for that type of player. So I'm going to give this a D plus grade on the signing. Yikes. Okay, that was 11 film breakdowns, but we are done. There were certainly other moves. I think all of them were pretty solid and self-explanatory. You know, bringing back Taylor and Michael Jackson and those prices, that sounds good to me. Um, the Seahawks can also just cut them at any time. Um, same thing with reworking D. Eskridge's contract. I think that's a good move. He's at least a kick returner. And, you know, I'll pay a million bucks for a solid kick returner. I am always going to be honest. I'm really not gonna be one of those channels who's just trying to hype you up. I will tell you if I don't like what I see on tape. But I really did like this free agency class. John Schneider did a really good job at filling the holes in this roster, save for one or two starting guards, but I think we'll fill that in the draft. But overall, this is our haul. We found two linebackers that I think give us a really good unit there. We found a pair of tight ends that I'm excited for. We also re-signed, honestly, one of our best players in Leonard Williams, and we got a swing tackle, which I'm hyped for. As the cherry on top, we also traded for a quarterback that I think could be a future starter, potentially. Jerome Baker and Rashawn Jenkins were, in my opinion, overpays. They're good players, but getting seven and six million dollars per year respectively, I just don't see the value there. I don't have a problem with these signings because every team has a ton of slight overpays like this, and I think they'll be good players at the end of the day and contribute. I don't know if looking back we'll see these as like really good signings, but you know, these are adequate signings to fill roster holes, which is fine. Overall, I think this was a vastly underrated offseason so far. The Seahawks are far better in my opinion, and they're going to net a bunch of comp picks in 2025. This was not splashy, but this measured approach is what being a GM is all about. My overall grade for this offseason would be a B plus. There was nothing incredible or franchise changing, but I think this was a pretty great offseason so far. Thank you so much for watching. 
These videos take a ton of time and this was by far my most ambitious yet. So please like and subscribe to share this and make sure you don't miss future episodes. As I mentioned earlier, you can support me on Patreon, which will help me expand what I'm able to do with this channel. Thank you so much for watching and go Hawks.